Let us reflect now on God's word together. First, let us pray. Lord, help us to understand your truth. For by our own reading, we can perceive the words on the page. We can study and find context, but truth is the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord, let my lips speak such truth, and our hearts receive your will and guidance as we dwell in your Holy Spirit together, and by your word, offer this truth, this life, this love to the world. All this in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. From where you're sitting, from where I stand, we ask, am I in the right place? That isn't just a question for me. It's not simply rhetorical. Where are we supposed to be? It is a question for anyone who would ever suggest themselves to be a Christian. And it's one we all need to ask. And not just once. It's not the question we ask before we buy a home. It's not the question we just ask when we're going on vacation. But at all these times and with every new dawn. Lord. Am I in the right place right now? And we ask ourselves if we are where we're supposed to be. And then we need to also ask, am I with who I am supposed to be with? Does my fellowship honor you, O Lord? Am I seeking out? Am I serving? Am I with those that you would have, uh, have me serve with? And we ask that question every day. Throughout the day. Again and again. Jesus observed how people behaved in relation to one another. And how we tend, they tended, to make places for ourselves. To seek out what we think is the best place, the best conditions for us. Such as the animals that brood and make their, their nests, their homes, carve out a place for, of, of dominance, of priority, of safety, that represents our self-worth, that helps the rest of the world see just who and what we are, and what we think of ourselves. And in so doing, we often trample down the world or put other people in other places or simply just elevate and seek to elevate ourselves to chief places. And the warning Jesus offers, now he gives the example of the wedding, the setting of the wedding, but this can happen in all sorts of places in life in our workplaces? Do we boast ourselves to a higher place only to be shunted down by supervisors and managers? Do we, in our social circles, act with an air of self-importance only to at some point have someone recognize us for who we really are, who we're afraid they all will see? Jesus proposed a counter-cultural activity experiment for the listening crowd. He said, when you come into a wedding, but the wedding is the example. So if you think of another setting to this, Jesus offers wedding. Jesus says, don't set yourself at the highest seat. The honor and privilege of conducting a wedding yes, yesterday. And I heard... The question is, as I was coming into the room, someone asking someone else, where am I supposed to sit? 
What astonished me was that it was being asked by the bride's family. They did not assume any certain seat. It might have even been the, the bride's mother, because I was talking to the groom at the time. But I heard the response given. You, you of course, have the choice of any seat in the house. Sit where it suits you best. Now you have to be a person of very special honor. And when it comes to the mother of the bride, I think only the bride surpasses a place of honor on the day of the wedding. And it was a joy. You could, you could see the joy in the family. We do have the choice of seats. And they found a good seat. A seat where they could, could see everything and, and not be overwhelmed by the experience. And each person in turn asking each other what a wonderful, humble family it was. They weren't vying for seats, but trying to offer up seats to others so that everyone could, could see and enjoy the celebration of that day. And I was struck that they wished to have their honor confirmed in this. I will say of that family, as I have known them through the years, that they have a tremendous humility and dignity about them. But until you meet them in a moment like that, you might mistake it for a quiet sort of pride. But the reality is, they're ready and willing to serve. And yet in that service, they are so deeply honorable. They wait for the invite. They do not impose their presence nor their faith on any, but when invited, let me tell you, they have set an example and brought others to the Lord to share the joy of what they believe. So we look to our, our day and we ask our prayers, Lord, where would you have me be? Whom would you have me serve? Lord, with whom do I share this work? And then we wait. Waiting is both the mark of our faith and the hardest part of it. There is no faith in instant gratification. Author and preacher Erwin Lutzer says, A Christian who walks by faith accepts all circumstances from God. He thanks God every, when everything goes good, when everything goes bad, and for the blues somewhere in between. He thanks God whether he feels like it or not. Jesus says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. When our action leads us to where we want to be, when the outcome seems worth the effort, and we come out of a situation when looking pretty good, we need to ask ourselves whose glory we've been serving. Is Christ exalted in our success? Or is this our success? And if Christ is not exalted, is that really a success? In the past four years here, we have really struggled with reaching out to our community. Some have felt that it is the minister's job to, to go around and convince people to get out to church, specifically this church, our congregation. And there was a special emphasis on people who were past members or, or friends of our current memberships. That they were my first calling, the first ones I was meant to convince. And I will not say I'm sorry. I do not share this view. Nevertheless, I spoke to and made an effort to meet with these past members of the community. Those pointed out to me. Many who would make no time, little effort to meet either with me, to come out for worship, or to discuss faith beyond that they might have a belief in God. But they know that the door is open to them, that there is a place for them, but for them that's where it ends. They have been convinced of the lie that faith is what they decide. That faith is to serve them, their ends. So that they have become the chief position in their faith. 
And to come together among those who would seek to humble themselves before God and share faith together undermines that idea of faith. That we would mutually admonish and discipline one another is of no interest to them. And they make themselves them, though they are invited to be with us. Not to, to become like us, not to, be, to model themselves after us, but with us to seek to model our lives after Christ. To be humble and servants in Christ's name. The writer to the Hebrews reminds us of that great hospitality we are meant to offer. The chief identity of the church being that we must always be keen and ready to entertain strangers. For thereby some have even entertained angels unaware. How might we show such a welcome? Even before, even after we hand someone a bulletin and point them to a seat. Do we recognize and respect differences? Are we concerned with who they are or more concerned with who they are not? Do we bother to get to know them, to discuss and discover one another in person and show the courage of our faith by the boldness to ask the world today, now who are you? Tell me about you, who you are. Are we willing to speak the, the words of change and the convictions of Christian faith with kindness and civility? For in such a humble stance, we set the example of being willing to change ourselves and be transformed by the love of Jesus Christ. And that Christ becomes the solid rock on which we stand. And it is not we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Jesus said, call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Welcome those who already assume that they have nothing to give, nothing to contribute. Why? Because people know the difference between being invited for who they are than for what they have and what they can offer. And God knows. When we place ourselves in places of self-righteousness, when we only mix with the right people, when our outreach is not to those who need to serve, but those who will serve us, God knows that we seek to have ourselves praised. Jesus' command is for us. If we want places of dignity and respect to make ourselves servants of all, that if we truly believe and want to glorify God, that we care for the poor and those who are in any way the least of these to come before God as children together. That is the glory. That is the glorification of God. Because if we make our life together here as the people of God about glorifying God and not ourselves, then we begin to realize the reality of heaven. Scotch Presbyterian theologian Thomas Boston wrote, Heaven is not a resting place where men may sleep out in eternity. There they rest not nor day nor night, but their work is their rest and continual recreation and toil and weariness have no place there. They rest there in God, who is the center of their souls. Here they find the completion or satisfaction of all their desires, having the full enjoyment of God and uninterrupted communion with Him. American Presbyterian scholar William Edward Biderwolf reminds us also, heaven would hardly be heaven if we could define it. The Bible, while giving us images, does not offer a definition of heaven as much as examples of it. Just so the Bible does not define the church as it does the greater task of defining love and faith and hope and giving us examples of it. Inviting the church through its humility and obedience to the word of God to be gathered together in the love and service to the glory of God, to the building up of God's kingdom. Offering healing and hope in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And in God's Holy Spirit, praise together, now and forever. Amen.